Welcome to our class on Reaching New Levels of Faith. My name is Curtis Hartshorn. I'm a minister with the Shakota Church of Christ in Shakota, Oklahoma. And I am so thrilled about this opportunity. This is a dream come true to me. I, I feel kind of like Esther, you know, when Mordecai came to her and was explained, you've come to this position and you need to go to the king. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. As I look at my life and the, the way that, that, that I've transitioned and the things I've learned about faith, and then to be able to connect with BibleTalk.tv is, is such a tremendous opportunity. BibleTalk.tv currently has over 16 million views and 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And so to speak to this large event venue is just a tremendous uh, thrill for me to get to do this. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. I was immersed into Christ at the age of 20, and I did not believe in God. I went from having no faith, no believing in God, to devoting my life to preaching of the gospel. And so when I first started in the ministry, I was amazed at how Christians would grow up in the same environment, they would hear the same sermons, they would go to the same classes, some of them even growing up in the same households. Some would flourish in their faith and others would fizzle out. And I always wondered about that. Why, when they have the same opportunity, would some grow and some wouldn't? And that really launched me into thinking about how we grow up spiritually. How does faith develop? And I started doing at first classes that I would teach, and then I got invited to do uh, seminars or, or gospel meetings or workshops. I've noticed in different parts of the country, we call those different things, but you know what I mean. I did sermon series. Uh, I was urged to write a book, and I, I did write a book. It called Reaching New Levels of Faith. You don't have to have this book to take the class, but just wanted to let you know that it's there, and you can obtain that through a link at Bible Talk. TV. I've written other books too. I've written four books. And so uh, those you don't need. But what I would encourage you to get is a student workbook. If you would get on our website and order that, we can send that to you. Or it is also a downloadable PDF if you'd like to make copies of that. I would love to during this class, if you would have that with you, those notes, that help you so much. I'm going to put blanks up on the screen with the answers filled out that are in your workbook, and it will help you to pay attention better to get more out of the class. More importantly than that, I really want to encourage you to have a Bible, an open Bible in front of you. Now, I understand that we listen to BibleTalk.tv in different venues. Some of you are listening to as you're driving down the road, and, and so obviously you can't have a Bible in front of you. But if at all possible, I know we're multitaskers, I know we're busy people, but if you could sit down and look at the passages that we're talking about instead of just hearing them, you will get so much more out of the lesson. So I really want to encourage you to do that. As I've done these seminars and things, you know, one of the first things that I discovered, I, I used to launch in, talk about what faith is and what the different levels of faith, and I would go, and then it occurred to me that I was talking to people that didn't even want to grow in their faith. And I would talk to some and they say something kind of like this. Well, I, I believe in God. I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized into Christ. So right now I have sufficient faith to go to heaven. Why do all this work to grow my faith? That's a fair question. And so I want to start this first lesson by answering that question. Why should I develop my faith? I'm going to give you six reasons why you should want to grow in your faith. There are six reasons to develop or increase your faith. The first one is, God wants me to grow. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 17 with me, and while you're turning there, let me set the scene for you. Jesus has been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's been there with three of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. While he was up there, the other nine were remained down in the village, and they had been approached by a man who wanted to have his son healed. 
And the apostles said, oh yeah, we can do this. And they tried and they failed. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, it's a disaster. Let's start reading in Matthew chapter 17, starting with verse 14. Now, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. You know, after Jesus fixes the situation, and he, he's obviously very disappointed. He calls them an unbelieving and perverted generation. He is so disappointed with their lack of faith. And even when the, the disciples come to Jesus afterwards, kind of hat in hand, and, and they're so embarrassed, I'm sure, and they say, oh, Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? We've seen you do this many times. It looks so easy. How come we couldn't do this? And Jesus' answer here is key. Because of the littleness of your faith. Oglopistes is the Greek word used here. It's one word. And it means puny faith. You got this puny faith, and that is the problem. Your faith is so small. And then he says, truly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. I, my translation says the size of, some say as small as, and I know why the translators add those words, but really that's not in the Greek. It's actually only as a mustard seed, meaning having the quality of a mustard seed. Now, one of the qualities of mustard seed is this small, but that's not the quality that Jesus is emphasizing because he just rebuked them at the beginning of verse 20 for having puny faith. And turn around and say, boy, I wish your faith was small. That doesn't make sense. What he's saying is, I wish your faith was like a mustard seed. Well, what's a mustard seed like? Well, he already explained back in chapter 13, if you'll back up there and read this with me. Matthew chapter 13. In one of his parables, it says in verse 31, it says, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And let me explain something about the phrase kingdom of heaven. That phrase appears 32 times in the Bible. All of them are in the book of Matthew. No other writer in the Bible uses this phrase kingdom of heaven. When Matthew uses this phrase, he's not talking about heaven. Just read them. Just look them up and read all 32. You'll be able to tell he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the kingdom, the people that are subject to the king, who are going to heaven. In other words, he's talking about the church. So the kingdom, the church, is like a mustard seed. It starts off small. And we know from reading Acts, it did start off very small. But it became huge, just like a mustard seed. This picture that I have on the screen for you right now is a mustard seed, an actual mustard seed. It's not the smallest seed in the world. Uh, some uh, grass seeds are smaller than that, but look how tiny that thing is. And yet, let me show you what it becomes. It is an actual mustard seed tree that you're looking at. So that tiny little seed becomes this huge tree. When Jesus says, your face should be as a mustard seed, 
What he's saying is it's okay if it starts off small, but I want your faith to grow. I don't want it to stay small. God wants your faith to grow. This is the first of six reasons that I've given you why you should develop your faith, but I could stop here, couldn't I? I mean, if you love God and God wants your faith to grow, that's enough reason, I would think. God wants you, He doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to move forward in your faith. That's the first reason. I'll go ahead and give you the others. Uh, number two, we either move forward in our faith or we're moving backward. There's never an in-between. There's never just, I'm, I'm holding my own. We're always moving forward or we're moving backward. In the book of Hebrews, if you'll turn with me there, please. The Hebrew writer is writing to Hebrews, Jews, who had become Christians, but they were looking back at the old Jewish ways. Oh, wasn't that kind of neat? And so as a result, they weren't really growing. They weren't moving forward in their faith. And the Hebrew writer is writing to try to convince them to grow in their faith. And look what he says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. It says, concerning him, and the him here is Melchizedek, who he has been comparing to Christ and Christ's priesthood. He's talking about some rather technical things, but he says, concerning him, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Uh, This word is the same word that's used in chapter 6, verse 12, where it's translated sluggish or lazy. You've become lazy in your hearing. You're not progressing the way that you should in hearing the gospel and growing in your faith. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The Hebrew writer says, you know, you're at a point in your Christianity where you ought to be a teacher's. But instead, instead of being on the solid food, you're actually on the milk. You're still in an infancy state. In other words, this isn't good. If you're not progressing in your faith, that's not good. If you're, actually, if you're not moving forward, you're actually moving backward. And you can argue and say, oh no, I'm just holding my own. But if, if you're not growing in God's eyes, that's that's negative progress because think about the way that we grow up physically. We start off, we're infants and then we become toddlers and then pre-adolescents and adolescents. And we just, we go through these stages of our faith and I'm going to, or stages of our life. And I'm going to teach you the stages of faith that, that kind of match up with those. But what if a child is growing for a while and then they just stop growing? Would you, if you were a parent, would you be okay with that? You say, well, at least they're holding their own. No, you would be alarmed. You'd be going to the doctor and say, hey, something's wrong here. Well, that's how God feels when we're not progressing in our faith. And he has expressed that by inspiring, inspiring this Hebrew writer to write this. By this time, you ought to be teachers. But here you are and you're, you're in your late teens and you're in your early 20s and you're, you're walking around with a baby bottle. That's not good. You should be progressing. You should be moving forward. He says, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Maybe by this time, you ought to be a song leader. Maybe by this time, you ought to be leading prayers or or teaching classes or attending church more regularly than you are or have a stronger prayer life. You should be progressing in your faith. We're either moving forward or we're moving backward. And so a reason to want to grow in your faith is so that you are not moving backward. Let me give you a third reason why you should want to grow in your faith. Without spiritual growth, we won't have numerical growth in our congregations. At least not for long. I mean, it's possible to go out and be all fired up and baptize a lot of people. And yeah, our numbers swell. But if there's no 
spiritual building of the faith underneath that, if we're not maturing these baby Christians, it all falls down. We've got to have spiritual growth as well as numerical growth. In other words, we have to have edification as well as evangelism. The passage I get that from is in Ephesians chapter 4. If you look at that with me, Paul, who was undoubtedly and a great authority on how to build a church. He planted uh, many churches and got them going. One was this church in Ephesus, who he's writing this letter back and he's sharing with them some things that they needed to be doing. And he tells them in Ephesians chapter four, verse 14, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and by craftiness and deceitful scheming. What's he talking about here? Growing up spiritually. We shouldn't be children anymore. We should be moving on. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. What's he talking about here? He's talking about spiritual growth. He says you, you've become Christians, and, and Paul had baptized most likely a lot of these people that he's writing to. He says now it's time to grow up. Put aside these childish ways, grow up in all aspects into Him. And that's who we're trying to, we're talking about growing in our faith. We're growing to be more like Christ, who was the the epitome of faith, obviously, the, the author and the perfecter of faith. We're growing up to be like Him. The whole body is doing this as we're fitted together. He talks about what every joint, all the sinews of of our body, what that pulls together. And it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. If you want the church to grow, and I hope you do. I mean, I've talked to a few Christians who don't want the church to grow. So, well, we're fine just where we are. Well, if you don't want the church to grow, your will is in opposition to the will of God because God wants all men to be saved. That's a precarious place to be. I hope you want the church to grow. Well, if you want it to grow, we've got to learn how to develop faith. And the best way for you to help the church to grow in their faith is for you to work on your faith and grow in your faith. Then you can help others when you've been through those experiences. So there's a great reason to want to grow in your faith. Let me give you a fourth reason. If God doesn't get you, then Satan does. Ooh, that's a scary thought, isn't it? If God doesn't get you, if he doesn't have your heart, Satan is going to have your heart. And there really is no middle ground. Let me show you from scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll look at a couple of scriptures here. First one in 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice what Peter says, starting in verse 6. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Now the next verse says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Peter starts by talking about giving our heart to God. Place yourself under the mighty hand of God. In humility, come into the presence of God. Give yourself to Him. Cast your anxiety upon Him. He cares for you. Give yourself to God. Why? Because verse 8 says, we have an adversary the devil, and he is walking around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. If you know anything about lions, lions are hunters and they will study a herd and they're watching to see who the slow ones are, who maybe the young or the weak, and that's the ones they're going to pick off. That's how Satan works. You need to want to work on developing your faith because if you don't, 
you're in Satan's hands. Satan's going to pick you off. He is desiring to have you. And he will if God doesn't have you. This is all the way through Scripture. In 1 John chapter 3 is another passage that talks about this. John agrees with Peter, both inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 says, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. John says there are children of God. But the ones who are not children of God are children of the devil. Now, that's what the Bible says. And you may say, well, you know, at this point in my life, I'm just neutral. I haven't really decided if I'm going to follow God or not. If you have not, you're still of the devil. That's what the Bible says. There's no neutrality. This isn't a game. This is a war, a spiritual war. And you have to choose a side. You're either with God or you're not with God. And if you're not with God, the Bible says you are with the devil. And if you continue to do evil and if you hate your brother, the Bible says you are of the devil. Jesus' words up here on the screen is, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. In Jesus' own words, he says, You need to be with me, because if you're not, you're against me. There is no neutrality. We have to decide. If God doesn't have us, then Satan does. Is that not enough reason to want to work on your faith? Let me give you another reason. Do you know without faith, you can't please God? Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll flip back and look at that again, uh, back to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, he says here in verse 6, And without faith... It is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You want to please God? Well, I'm sure you do, or you wouldn't be watching this video. Well, if you want to please God, you have to have faith. And we've already established God wants you to have a growing faith. Uh, a growing faith that secures your relationship with Him. The stronger your faith is, the more secure you are in your walk with God. I want to please God. How about you? Well, let's work together to develop our faith. There's five reasons why we should want to grow in our faith. I have one more for you. Faith development fosters healthy and harmonious relationships in the family of God. Now, this point came about after I'd done several seminars, workshops, gospel meetings, where I would hear back from church leaders, elders, ministers. I would call back, say, hey, how did everything go? What do you think? And over and over again, I was hearing something like this. I would hear, you know, it's kind of strange, but since you have done that a month ago or whatever it was, we're closer as a congregation than we've ever been. It increased our unity talking about faith. When I heard that, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. How could that happen? Well, what happens is when I understand how faith develops and how my faith develops and other people, I see, well, they're going through the same things that I am. Maybe they're at affiliating faith right now, or maybe they're going through uh, this particular struggle. When we get to Searching faith. We're going to talk about the four basic struggles of searching faith. And everybody goes through at least one of those struggles. But we don't all go through the same ones. And so they are understanding. Once you understand that there's different people that have different struggles, you say, okay, well, man, they're going through that right now. It makes you be more patient, a little more understanding. I mean, it really is a great benefit when we start developing 
our faith because you realize others are struggling too. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you look at this with me, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look what Paul says to the younger Timothy, starting in verse 24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will, meaning to do the devil's will. It says, the bondservant of, of Christ really shouldn't be, shouldn't be argumentative. We, should, we shouldn't be quarrelsome. We, we should be kind to all. Because we understand each other. We need to be patient when we're wronged. You know, it's going to happen. It's just bound to happen that in a church where people are interacting, somebody's going to say something wrong. Somebody's going to do the wrong thing. And it's going to offend you. And you can get mad about it and you say, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with them or maybe I'm not going to go to church anymore. Or you can understand that that person has faults and they're trying to work on their faith just like you're trying to work on yours. And when you do that, there'll be a, a gentleness about you, more of an understanding where we don't let those things get us down. We understand that, that God will grant them repentance they're going to change. I'm going to change, and I'll talk more about that later on. But others are struggling too. When you're developing your faith, you'll be more patient, and your congregation will have more patience. And, and elders will get along with each other, and elders and ministers will get along, and, and everybody in the church, that filters down when we understand that we all need to grow in our faith. We're trying to reach new levels of faith. And I've given you six reasons why you should want to progress, move further in your faith. I am so pumped up and excited about this class, but I need you to be motivated. Because if you don't watch it till the end, if you don't go through all 16 lessons, then you know it's not going to uh, do you near as much good. I want you to get all of this material. And so you're going to need to be motivated to do that. So pick out one of those six or come up with your own. Maybe you have a better reason why you want to grow in your faith. But get a motivation for wanting to develop your faith. In our next class, we're going to talk about what is faith. And I'm going to go through and show you exactly just what this is about. And then I'm going to teach you the different levels of faith. We're going to talk about the struggles of searching faith. As I already mentioned, there's a lot of stuff that I want to teach you. But for now, just think about your motivation. Why do you want to go on with this? Really hope to see you in our next class. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again.